verses 1 through 18 this morning. We've been saying a lot, really, through this series, through our, uh, the series before in Ecclesiastes, we've been saying how, how life is unpredictable. Like, it's just, it's just a reality that we know, that, that we can't really plan what is going to happen in our lives. And, and there's times in life, that there's times in your life that you just want to pretty much bottle up. Like there's times that you want to remember, there's times that are, are great, there's times that you, you never want to forget. There's, there's moments in, li- in life that you would probably just want to keep. Like maybe it's uh, for you, maybe it's like a, a wedding day or maybe it's graduation like we're celebrating today. It's, it's a moment, it's a marker in life. Maybe it's a, a birth of a child or, or maybe it's a, a dream once in a lifetime vacation. That you got to go on and everything was perfect and everything went as planned. And and you just kind of wish that moment would never end. I mean, there's times, there's moments in life where where that is true. And and then there's times we all know that we would just rather like to forget. There's things that happen to us. There's moments that, that take place. Like maybe it's things like getting laid off at work or getting fired from a job. Maybe it's... You're planning your dream vacation and and you're ready to go and it just rains the entire time and everything that could potentially go wrong just went wrong the entire time. Maybe there's a divorce or a tragedy or something horrible that happens. The thing is, both happen in life. You're going to have great moments in life. You're going to have hard moments in your life. And Paul's been telling us that's true, Paul who wrote this book, He's saying that's true to life in general, but it's also true in in your spiritual life. Think about living out your faith. There's going to be moments as you're living out your faith that you'd like to bottle up. There's going to be moments, let's just say it, that you'd rather forget. If you are living out your faith and if you are proclaiming Jesus, if you are standing on biblical truth, there will be moments of great joy. And there's going to be moments of great hardship. There's going to be moments in your spiritual walk where you're just on fire for God. And and you just want to go and you want to share your faith and you want to talk about it. And you want to proclaim it to everyone. And then there's going to be moments when you're living out your faith where you just want to throw in the towel. You want to throw in the towel because you're doubting, you're questioning God, you're, you're not understanding what's going on, and, and things aren't working out the way you, you thought they would, and those moments will come. And what I think Paul does in chapter 4 is, is very simple. Paul is encouraging the church, you and I, this young church in, in Corinthians, he's encouraging the church, do not lose heart. Do not lose heart because you have a superior message that's been gifted to you that needs to be proclaimed. It's a really straightforward section of encouragement to this church to not throw in the towel and to not give up when you enter in to those hard moments of living out your faith. So if you have your Bibles, uh, let's start by looking at verses 1 through 6 this morning. As we check out this whole chapter, Paul says this. He's saying, therefore, whenever you read a therefore, it's referring back to what he just said. So we talked about it last week, chapter 3. He talked about the message that we have. He's referring to that, that new covenant ministry that's been ushered in through Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's saying, therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face 
of Jesus Christ. So we know this. We, we know living out your faith is going to be hard at times. You're going to have critics. Paul has had his critics throughout this entire book that we've been looking at. We're going to have our critics. Think of that, the chief kicker, uh, the, the Kansas City Chiefs, the kicker. I forget his name. But he gave his whole commencement speech. He's been getting drilled since for some of the things that he said, for some of the morals and the values that he was standing on. You're going to have critics when you stand on values and you stand on morals. If you live and if you actually live and think differently than the world around you, if you are going to walk uphill while everyone else is walking downhill, if you hold to historical faith, I guarantee you issues will eventually arise. It, it, it's a reality that can send one spiraling into discouragement. And that's why Paul's saying, do not lose heart because God in his mercy through the Spirit, has given you this powerful gospel ministry. Critics may come. People may leave. Friends may start to question you. Maybe friends think you're kind of weird at this point. Family may not like what you're doing. You can even be despised. But Paul's saying, even if those things happen and those critics come, church, don't be tempted to tamper with the message. It's basically saying, don't be tempted to water it down. Because that's what tends to happen. When, when loud voices come and critics come, we, we tend to kind of want to, we kind of want to quiet down. And, and the tendency is to tamper with the message and kind of water it down so, so maybe it's a little more palatable to those around us. He's saying don't be tempted to water down. Don't be tempted to give some kind of gospel light message just to please people. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. We need to be aware of how we are speaking and how we are handling the word of God. And if we are rightly handling the word of truth. If people are blind to the truth, he tells us it is because Satan has blinded them and Satan has veiled their eyes. There is a, a spiritual warfare that takes place around us that, that I think we, we tend to dismiss way too quickly. There's this spiritual unseen warfare that takes place around us where Satan is blinding the eyes of people so they're not open to seeing and hearing and understanding the gospel. Our role is that we are to faithfully proclaim it. We can't change hearts. The spirit changes hearts. But we are to proclaim it and then pray that the veil would be lifted off of people's eyes. As Acts 26 where they prayed that their eyes would be opened so that they may turn from darkness to light. From the power of Satan to God. So that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. We are church to boldly proclaim the gospel that Jesus Christ is Lord. You, you say that term. You proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord alone, above all else. There is no other. There's no other way. You are going to have critics. And yet scripture says over and over, Jesus Christ alone is Lord. He holds authority. Jesus Christ came into this world incarnate, into the virgin, uh, in a virgin birth. And he came incarnate to save sinners. He was the prophesied Messiah. He lived the life that you and I could not live. Jesus was crucified for our sins. He was resurrected three days later. He now sits exalted at the right hand of the Father, declaring all is finished. And all who confess and believe in him will be saved. Our goal in everything that we do is to point people to that message and is to point them to Jesus Christ. It's not to point people to ourselves. If, if you haven't figured out, like, I'm not the main event. This stage is not the main event. You are not the main event. Jesus Christ is the main event. And everything we do in our lives, how we speak, how we act, should not be pointing people to ourselves, but should be pointing people to Christ. 
Because Jesus Christ is Lord. I can't forgive people's sins. I can't give people eternal life. Jesus Christ alone can do that. You know what you and I are? You and I are simply vessels. We are vessels that God has chosen to use to point people to himself. God, the creator and the sustainer and sustainer of the universe, who brought light into this world, does the same thing with our hearts. And we are to be lights that shine this superior message. This world, and you know this, this world produces so many faulty messages. You're getting messages all the time, 24-7. Why? We're on our phones all the time. We're on our devices all the time. We're getting fed news and information, and we're hearing voices from so many different people all the time. You are putting messages into your mind every single day, all the time. You're hearing noises all the time, voices everywhere telling you, even right now, you're getting a voice telling you things. you got to figure out what's right and what's true and what's fact. Because you're getting voices that are everywhere telling you what to do, what to believe, how to identify yourself, where purpose is found. You're getting voices and you're hearing all kinds of noise telling you what's priority, what values you should be setting, what goals you should be setting. And a lot of these voices are leading many people down dangerous, irreversible paths. People are looking, and maybe you don't use this language, but people are looking. They want to identify with something. People want community. People are made to be in relationship. People want to feel important. People want to feel accepted. People want to feel valued. And they're going to listen to all kinds of voices that are going to point them to that direction. But Paul's saying, we have the message, church, that gives true meaning. And we are to be the lights that shine it. So don't lose heart. God is sovereign. Maybe things in the world seem out of control. But God is sovereign. God is not caught off guard. And God's hands aren't tied. With integrity and with humility, we are to shine light on the message of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus is a treasure that you and I carry within ourselves. Look at what he says in verses 7 to 12. He says, we have this treasure. But we have this treasure in jars of clay. To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to, the de to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This is what he's saying. And I love the imagery here. And maybe this is a passage that you've heard a thousand times. This is like a, an old song that I can't even remember. I mean, I remember because we used to sing it in youth group, and I'm not going to sing it. But anyway, it's telling us this. We, we are fragile, imperfect vessels. That, that's what we are. But we are fragile, imperfect vessels that God has chosen to use. We know our bodies break down. As we age, we crack and we get older and all these things happen. Like our bodies break down. When, when it's talking about jars of clay, clay jars back then, they were like the Tupperware containers of the day. Like, like the, the most horrible thing you can think of. They were, let's just be honest, they were just cheap. I guess Tupperware is not really that cheap anymore, is it? I don't know. I don't buy Tupperware. I try to throw it out. But um, the Tupperware containers today, like, it was probably the number one cause of divorce back then, just like it is now. Because everyone has the dreaded Tupperware drawer. And everyone has the, the, what, the drawer that just seems to give birth overnight or weekly because it's always growing. Nothing ever fits and nothing ever matches. And every time you open the drawer, they all fall out. You can tell I have issues in my house. But listen, they, they're, they're just... 
There's just cheap transportation for leftovers that if the food was good in the first place, it wouldn't be leftover. So a a anyway, but that, that's not true because I, I, that's not true. That's, that's not true. I, I enjoy taking leftovers uh, to work because my wife makes very good uh, meals often. <laughs> but I hate the Tupperware. So a a anyway, because there's never a lid that fits. But here, th this is the point, like clay jars were for convenience. And this is the thing, God uses faulty vessels to carry, this mix up right here, his most precious message, like your precious leftovers, all right, to carry his most precious message, our inadequacies, our weaknesses are the conduit for God's power. The message is never meant to be, was never meant to be, look how good I am. Look how much my family has it all together. Look how perfect I live this Christian life. You should all wish you could be like me. That's never the message. The message was never meant to be, look how good I am. The message has always been, look how good God is. Look how great Jesus Christ, his son, is. This is embrace your weaknesses. Watch God's strength and power be revealed through you as you embrace your weaknesses. In life, there are going to be times that you will feel afflicted. You are absolutely going to feel afflicted. You're going to be perplexed. You're going to be confused. You're going to feel at times forsaken and abandoned and, and struck down. There's going to be times where you're going to feel like you got nothing left to give. You're tired. You're burned out. You're drained. You had enough. There's been too many voices and too many critics, and you just can't take it anymore. You may feel it at work. Like no matter how much you do or how hard you work or how much effort you give, you never get recognized or you can never get ahead. You might feel it in school, right? Like no matter how hard I study or whatever happens, it's like someone hacks the system and school gets canceled anyway. And all this stuff, like it, it, it happens. Like you still get, it doesn't matter as much I study, I still get to see. Or you might feel it in, in your family. It's like no matter how much I try to engage my family, no matter how much I try to talk to them, they, they don't listen and, and things still go crazy. And no matter the effort, I still feel like I fail everyone. You, you can feel it spiritually. It's like no matter how much I, I read the Bible, no matter how much I pray, no matter how much I, I, I go to church, I still struggle with the same sin over and over and over again. It's like no matter how much I pray or what I do, I still doubt, I still fear, I still wonder if it's all true, if, I still wonder if it's all worth it. Is, it, is death going to show me I've been, I've been played by everything? And, and Paul's declaring life in general. Life in general and spiritually, especially as you live out your faith, you will feel and experience these things. Paul experienced them to the extreme. You're going to experience them. But he says, but no, you carry the gospel treasure. You carry God's power. His strength is revealed in our weaknesses. You may experience affliction, church, but you are never crushed. You are never in despair. You are never abandoned. You are a redeemed child of God who cannot be destroyed, not even by death itself. In all affliction, you may be knocked down, but you are not out. Our weakness is an occasion for God's power. Our suffering follows the pattern of Christ's suffering. We are to die to ourselves every single day so that Jesus Christ is fully known and fully seen in us. Every day I wake up, and I'm not saying I do this, but every day we should, we should wake up and say, I am not going to live to showcase myself. I'm going to live to showcase Jesus Christ. You will struggle at times. And there's going to be afflictions that you're going to experience that may knock you right off your feet. We are just weak vessels that gain cracks as we age. And yet we're moving towards death. We're moving towards death. And yet through us, God displays his eternal life offered in Jesus Christ. You know why Paul can keep that in front of him and keep that perspective? 
he, he keeps that, and he's able to, to have that attitude because of the way he views the future. Because of what he believes. His belief in the future is guiding everything that he does. Look at verses 13 through 18 at the end of chapter 4 here. It says, since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake, so that the grace extends to more and more people. It may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to these things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul's future perspective what he believes about the future, it directs his current decisions and attitudes. He knows, Paul. if you know anything about Paul, he, he knows that the grace of God changed him. And you read it in the book of Acts on the Damascus Road. He was once a persecutor of the church. He wanted nothing more than to see the church destroyed and wiped out. And now he's on the forefront, the front lines of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of the death and resurrection of, of Jesus Christ for our sins. He's on the front lines of proclaiming that. He knows he's been transformed by God's grace. There's no other reason. If anyone deserved the words, it was Paul. And yet he knows by his grace that God's transformed him and God's changed him. And that's going to continue on all the way up until he reaches, he reaches his final glory. He knew one day, and he knows, right? He, know, he knew one day he would be raised like Christ. What you and I believe about the future dictates how we live today. And, and so often when we think about the future, we really don't think that far ahead. We, we stop with maybe like certain markers in our life. Like, like a lot of young people, like graduation is this week, and that's awesome. We should celebrate that. That's a, it's a great marker. But there's so much more beyond graduation. There's so much more beyond getting a home or getting married or having kids. There's so much more than working just towards retirement. There's so much that in our future, sometimes I think it just kind of stops with retirement. We, we live for retirement. And yet Paul would say there's so much more than just retirement. There's so much more than those things because Paul believed death wasn't the end but a passageway to resurrected life. And he rearranged his life around that belief. He was willing to go through affliction. He was willing to suffer. He was willing to do so much because he fully believed Christ was risen from the dead. He was the first fruit. And Paul will follow him. And Paul will be raised like him. And everyone who knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be raised like him. So he rearranged his life around that belief. That belief guided and directed every decision. How he, he set his priorities. What he valued. How he identified himself. All those things. His ultimate hope was a future resurrection. And that hope steadied him during affliction and trials. Don't lose heart, church. These afflictions, he says, are temporary, preparing us, preparing us for greater things. Our bodies, our bodies are breaking down. We, we, don't, need any, we don't need to say that anymore. They're breaking down. They're, they're breaking down. They're vessels that one day... One day, though, all the weight that we feel now will be lifted for glory beyond imagination. One day, this sinful man will be completely and permanently renewed, bodies glorified, and Jesus magnified. So church, in closing, Paul is simply trying to encourage, encourage as we go through the highs and lows of life, do not lose hearts. 
Live out your faith. You have the superior message of the gospel that needs to be proclaimed. It's been given to you by the grace of God. It's been given to you by God's grace to be proclaimed. Afflictions are going to come. Inadequacies are going to be felt. You're going to experience them. But in the weakness, God's strength will be seen. Live each and every day relying on the power of God that is within you to proclaim his truth, to help you persevere through the afflictions and through the trials in a way that your life is never pointing to yourself and how good it is, but in a way that it's pointing to Jesus Christ and how great he is and how much he is needed and needs to be seen in this desperate world today. Let's close in a word of prayer, and then the worship team will come up and uh, wrap up the service for us today. Father God, I do pray, God, that we would be a people that we point to you uh, above all else. God, that, that even though we may feel at times that we're inadequate or maybe we feel that we're in over our heads and we're experiencing tremendous amount of affliction and, and just trial in our lives, God, let us know and be reminded of that treasure that we have within us. And then, God, that as we live uh, faithfully in our, our weaknesses and in, our, in our, our struggles and inadequacies, God, that you will reveal and show your power and your strength. And, and God, so let us be a people that we live knowing that one day, one day you will raise us like Jesus was raised from the dead. And God, let that direct every decision and the things that we make uh, now as we live here uh, each and every day, Lord. And God, let us live in a way where we are proclaiming you and showcasing how great you are above all things. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.